And, and it's not to shame where I was because where I was is where I had to be to get to here. All right. So here we are. We are going to have a discussion, a chat with Stephanie from my great and spacious world. I emailed her after I viewed some videos that she created and posted on YouTube. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself? I'm Stephanie. I started my great and spacious world after leaving the church. The purpose of it was mostly to be able to say the things that I wanted to say, talk about my transition with people who wanted to hear about it. And it was really good for me to be able to talk and get feedback from people who had went through it, just like I had helped me process feelings, help me not feel alone. We wanted to talk about just how people reacted, the good ways that people reacted, maybe the negative ways that people reacted. Yeah, what were some of the good reactions that you got? I did have some good support leaving. My husband had left before me. Um, and his reaction was great all the time. When I said I was going to stay in the church, when I said I was doubting, but I might still stay, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> you know, and when I said I left, like, I think that kind of speaks to the kind of guy he was, that he was able to support me through all the phases and i had a best friend if you go over to my channel ken uh kendra is on that channel we talk a lot and she was able to support me so you know i had some good support of two people who had left before me i also had some great reactions from people that were still in the church there were just like a few close friends that i opened up to who were like, yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, we still think you're a good person. We hope we can still be friends. I remember I was facing a lot of hard things and rejections, which I'm sure we'll talk about later with uh, some other people. And then one of my friends, when I told her, she messaged me back and she said, I hope we can still be friends, even though I'm Mormon. Like she was concerned about me rejecting her and I, it made me cry because I was like, of course I won't protect you. Like you're the first person that has made me feel like safe and were, was more worried about me and how I was doing instead of how this affects you. <laughs> yeah. It was a totally different reaction than the reactions I had got thus far. And my siblings were amazing about it. They, they came and supported me and made sure that I was doing okay mentally. They, they really put my mental health first, which I really appreciated. Probably one of the emotional, one of the more emotional times that I told anybody was one of my good friends. And I was afraid that we weren't going to be able to be friends anymore. And so I was like in tears and she was in tears. She's like, why would I stop being your friend? But it's interesting because later on there was kind of a rough patch there because she was such a good listener. And I think I gave up too much. And it was too much for her. And she wasn't able, mm -hmm. honestly, to set some boundaries to say, like, I don't want to hear all of this. <laughs> this is affecting me or her. So I, some of the bad reactions, my bishop didn't take the news well. And that was hard for me because I was thinking that he'd be our greatest source of uh, support. Because we, John and I had both had high callings in the ward. So I felt like we had a friendship and, um, and I really needed support. So I think I went in with really high expectations of, of what would happen. And I, I was met with more fear, I, I believe, which led to a lot of like convincing and telling me that I'm wrong and the opposite of support. I was so hurt in that moment and it didn't end well. I, I, I left because I just didn't feel like it was being productive and, and, and it really hurt me. But you know, when I reflected on it, I was like, 
it makes sense. He was kind of like blindsided. He didn't see this coming. So his reaction was what someone who's blindsided would do. <laughs> right. And we reached out and repaired that situation. I, I reached out and made sure he was okay. He reached out and made sure I was okay. And it was jarring to me. And it, it felt personal in the beginning. And I think a lot, as I tell other stories, you'll see that in the beginning, a lot of it feels so personal and it hurts. The farther I get away from those experiences and the more confident I am in my ability to make decisions, right or wrong, um, you know, I can separate myself from people's reactions easier. Yeah. Another one of my family members, they, they went as far as like hosting an intervention while my husband was out of town. And that, that was super hard on me because I could see so clearly that they didn't accept my decision. I looked to this person as a mentor. And so to have them not accept my decision made me feel like maybe I was doing something wrong. So that was really hard for me to go through as I'm going through my faith transition. Looking back at it now, I'm like, well, I know I can see their belief system. Like obviously they're just trying to save me from hell, which is a loving thing, I suppose, if that's your belief system. And so I think that's where leaving the church and navigating those relationships can get tricky. Um, and it just takes, I think it takes time for both parties to figure out the awkwardness and how to navigate it. I thought you brought up a lot of good points about boundaries. After that intervention, I did set a lot of boundaries. I said things like, when you send me church material, I know you have my best interests at heart, but I thought you should know that that gives me panic attacks. And I, I don't think that's what you, your intentions are. I have these panic attacks and they last most of the day. I'm going to ask you to stop sending me church material in the mail. I had to set some harder boundaries. Like I want to be by you, but if you make my husband the enemy, I can't be by you. If you make my kids choose between you and, and us, I can't bring my kids to be around you. Just being really clear, like if these situations happen, then that's why I'm pulling back. It's not that I don't want to have a relationship with you. It's that I can't be in a relationship when these things are happening. Okay, you had a moment with your bishop, for example, mm -hmm. that it went south. And it stayed like that for a while, but it was repairable. What made you realize you wanted to repair it? And um, like, were you guys able to be the ones that make that for, made that first step? Or what did that look like? Our ward is also our neighborhood. So we all live really close together. And like, even just walking past each other's houses, I didn't want there to be tension. Or like, I'm like, we're going to run into each other. And I, I don't want this to be our last interaction i just reached out I, I believe he reached out as well right after but i don't think i responded because i wasn't ready i just reached out and i was like hey in that meeting i was feeling insecure and i'm sure you were shocked you know just validating both sides of our story this is why we ended up in this in in this position um and validating both sides I just wanted him to know that I was going to let it go and not harbor those hard feelings. And, and if I had done anything that I, I want to repair that. And he said that he was on the same page. So it was easy to repair, I guess. I, I put my foot in my mouth too, along the way, the farther you get away mm -hmm. from it, you can kind of see that a little better. I remember saying to one of our neighbors and all of our neighbors have been really friendly. Our kids are all the same age. They still play together. Mm -hmm. And I said to one of my neighbors, how I had like graduated from, from belief and how demeaning that sounded. And I am almost immediately regretted it, but I, I don't mm -hmm. think she harbors anything against me. She totally could like, mm -hmm. that's just such a snotty thing to say <laughs> to somebody. I've heard a lot of ex-Mormons give the analogy of, 
it's like Santa Claus. And once you know, you right. can't come back. And I think it is kind of accurate for it. It does feel that way, but it, the it also feels so belittling to someone's belief. Can we separate those two? Can we say that that is how it feels for us, but also we're not going to use that example because it's belittling? Right. And that's yeah. like a really hard balance to, mm -hmm. to have there. You get into this when you start comparing the church to a cult. Like, yeah, there are some similarities going on there. And at some point, I just wonder how useful it is to use those analogies. Our society is very culty in a way as well. Mm -hmm. Like you can yeah. use that cult analogy in a lot of ways. And at some mm -hmm. point it just becomes a language barrier, I think, or not even a language barrier, but a description barrier when the person you're talking to doesn't agree. If they really ask me, I'll be honest with them and I'll tell them. But if I can find a better way to describe it that we both can agree on, that just seems mm -hmm. a lot more useful when we're having yeah. conversations. You see this happening in the political world too. Someone will define a certain term a certain way and not both sides are agreeing on that definition. And so mm -hmm. at some point you're not communicating anymore. <laughs> so yeah. one side's just shutting down. I yeah. think that's the problem that you're pointing out with the word cult is that, well, now the other side isn't listening because they're feeling defensive. Right. Uh, well, they don't see it that way. But the word cult is never associated with anything good. And people see themselves in their organization as good. Right. So they can't associate it with the word cult because there's no positive connotation there. And then the other thing is, it's really easy to associate cult with something bad. And it's interesting because I think on the side, when you leave, you actually do have a really hard time remembering the good things. Like mm -hmm. there were things that were keeping you there when you're on the edge, you know, when you're on that mm -hmm. fence and trying to decide, do I stay or do I go? Of course, mm -hmm. there were things pulling you to stay and not all of them were just manipulation. Like that's just yeah. not real. We associate with our neighborhood still. And so if, I mean, it's hard. It's not really our ward. We've resigned. So we're still really friendly. And so when they invite us to some activity or something, we'll go if we're available and the kids want to go. And so we go, the girls like their activities. So they go and I help out when they need help. Um, that's been fairly new. Um, mm -hmm. I got asked to help specifically from a friend and I, had a, I was like, shoot, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't know if I can like show up in the building and how that's going to be for me. And it was actually, I'm glad I did it because it ended up being quite nostalgic. I was like, oh, like this does feel like home and mm -hmm. it wasn't triggering. And so I'm glad I went. Um, I mean, they did an activity on gratitude. Like, I don't know. I, I can support that. We have so much more in common with members than not. I feel like a lot of what, why people do anything is just instinctual. And then we rationalize why we're doing it. And I, I'm not sure that the instincts that are telling people to stay in the church are really all brainwashing. So that's another reason I don't really love the cult analogy. I just think that people should follow their intuitions. If someone's yeah. intuition is telling them to stay, I think they need to follow that through to the end. You were talking about how when you leave, you can't remember the good. And I almost wonder if that's, that's like just a stage that you go through to get out. Like, right? Maybe you wouldn't leave it unless you let go of all of it, the good and the bad. You just like let it go so that you can leave. And then when you're further away from it, you can come back and you can say, this is the good that I've experienced in this religion and this is why I left. And they can both exist in my mind now, where when I was leaving, I just had to leave everything. Does that make That's sense? interesting. No, I, yeah. that could be, cause I've, I talked to my brother who is, he, he's not a traditional believer. He married a believer and they kind of agreed that they weren't going to push each other's beliefs on each other and they still got married. Yeah. And I talked to that brother a lot. I was really struggling. I'm like, how do you go to church knowing X, Y, Z? 
Mm -hmm. then when they say these things that are just not, they're so certain about X, Y, Z, and they, they can't be certain about X, Y, Z. How do you stand that? And he's like, well, it's like reading a self-help book. I can read a Mm self-help book and take the good stuff. And I don't agree with everything the author says, but that doesn't mean I can't enjoy the book still. Mm -hmm. And that was so foreign to me when I was going through that. I can't see anything good phase. Mm -hmm. I think that's because how we were raised and how we decided to practice Mormonism. And tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth is it's either all right or it's all wrong. I mean, that's how I was in Mormonism. Yeah, it's very black and white. Yeah, it was was all black and white for me. So, um, yeah, I think I think there are Mormons that maybe have a more mature faith. I guess now I'm insulting me and you. <laughs> like just maybe more of a balance where their intuition comes into play. And my intuition was always trumped by whatever the church said. And in order to break away from that, I left the church and finding my voice, being comfortable making choices for myself and trusting myself. That's a process. Yes. No, I, I, I went through that same, I went through that same realization. I've met, um, several active members that seem to have learned these life lessons and they didn't have to go through a Mm -hmm. whole collapse of belief system. Mm -hmm. They seem to learn these things. And I don't know, I feel like the last few years I was starting to gain these perspectives and Mm -hmm. maybe if the cards played out different and (laughs) things didn't happen how they happen. I could still be somewhere like that and still have learned the Mm -hmm. lessons. I don't know. I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. I don't worry too much about, um, like I have no fear that I've done anything wrong by leaving the church. There's nothing there that I, um, I worry about. Mm -hmm. I feel like if there's something true there, then I'll figure that out at some point. The way I describe it to members, I'm like, okay, poof, the church is gone. Which church do you join? And that's how I feel. Like, yeah, there's no special place uh, for that faith any more than any other Christian faith or any other religion, really. That goes back to what you were talking about with the Brene Brown thing, where you can be free to belong nowhere and everywhere. Yeah. Belong to yourself now. I think the thing that I struggle the most with the church is, do I think there's good? Yes. Do I think there's bad? Yes. Do I think they have truth? Yes. Do I think they lie? Yes. <laughs> um, but the thing, the thing that I think I really have problem with is them saying they're the one and only true way and they work for everyone. That's just not true to me. And I think, that's where the most problems come in. If they could say like, these are our philosophies, these are our teachings, use what helps you. I think the whole Mormon experience would be different, much more healthy. Um, and one where people like us could exist if we chose to. In my life, in Mormonism and then post-Mormonism, I think I was so focused on all the positive feelings, all the faith promoting feelings and kind of avoiding negative feelings, avoiding questions. The whole Satan thing too is really complicated because life is not all rainbows, sunshine and flowers. And if you can't ever think of the dark side of life, if you're not even allowed to go to the struggle, the grief, but like your life isn't full and you might be lying. It's a naive way to live. Yeah, you're probably lying to yourself too. And so I think that's been one of the best freedoms of leaving the church is I had, can have a full range of emotions. Emotions. I can see the good side of, say, anger. The good side of anger is I can stand up for myself. Anger motivates me to right the wrong and can anger be used in a bad way yes it can be used to hurt people it can be used to do things that you regret but it can also be used to point out where there's injustice i just like the freedom of thought and not having to worry if i'm listening to the holy ghost or satan and just focus on what are both sides of this story and where's the truth 
in in this whole mess and actually implementing faith in my life and yeah. you really don't get to take steps or action in faith if you're already mm -hmm. certain that you're taking the right actions mm -hmm. like you really do have to walk in uncertainty in life and mm -hmm. everybody is yes. i believe and so mm -hmm. you kind of make your best judgment on what the right actions are to take and you have faith that it's going to produce a certain outcome that will help you get towards your goals. Yeah. Along with faith, you have to embrace failure, which is another thing that I did not embrace as a Mormon because as a Mormon, failure meant I had to go through repentance and I, I could only be perfect. So I either had to make the right choice or go through repentance. I had, I, I could never own that it's okay to make mistakes. In my Mormon mind, it's never okay to make mistakes. So you always are striving to make the right choice. And if you don't, you have to feel the shame and guilt. And who wants to feel that? And now I'm just like, oh, I made the wrong choice. And I've learned something from it. Like less shame, less guilt, but still a pivot. The pivot is without the shame and guilt. It's yeah. just like, there's my lesson. And, and not like beating myself up. But being like, you know, you made this choice with, and, and you did the best you could with the information you're given, with your state of being. And I'm not mad at you for making this mistake, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Shame and guilt just makes you stuck. It just gives you an excuse to keep doing whatever you're messing up on. Like if it's inaction mm -hmm. and you're feeling really shame and guilty <laughs> for your inaction, you're just like, oh, I guess I might as well just keep on not acting and mm -hmm. just stay stuck it, well it also like helped it made me give my voice to others because if i didn't know if i can make the right choice then i'll do what my husband tells me to do or my bishop or the prophet because then i can't be held accountable hmm. for what happens and but that's so disempowering it's i might like now that i've been empowered with my own choice i would rather make mistakes trying to do my best than to just follow someone and let them take the fall out. <laughs> right. Right. Do you feel like boundaries are permanent? Like I kind of feel like sometimes you are in a place where you have to set up some boundaries, mm -hmm. but they're not permanent all the time. I'm sorry. I'm kicking. I agree with you. I do not think boundaries are permanent. I think like if someone was to send me a church article today, I either read it out of curiosity or throw it away because I'm not interested. I told you that it was giving me panic attacks. Um, it, yeah, my, that would not be my reaction anymore. Cause time because, does change those boundaries. I feel like I have, yeah, I have wounds that are healed. I I'm better mentally. So yes, I think your boundaries can change. I don't think they have to be forever. Yeah. I think one of the boundaries that we felt like early on, we're like, we don't want our kids being indoctrinated by our family, right? We're freaking out. Yes. And as time's gone on, I've kind of realized that they can't be indoctrinated in a two hour visit. Like, <laughs> and it's okay for them to rub shoulders with these ideas. Cause maybe there's something helpful they can learn. Mm -hmm. There's just all kinds of boundaries that I've been able to grow past, I guess, I feel like just a lot of active members that I feel like have a lot of wisdom that I can learn from. I had a lot of anxiety around my kids too in the beginning. Um, but I think my kids have proven to me that they don't need me to protect them, that they yeah. can like make their own choices. What a crazy idea. Right. Right. A great example is new primary president has been put in. She didn't know our situation. I had heavily boundaried the old primary president and she was just wonderful at respecting my point of view. Anyway, so new primary president comes and invites my kids to um, temple preview. Yes, temple preview and priesthood preview. I have a funny story about that after you're done. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, the boys answered the door. I was um, cooking or downstairs. Anyway, so I got to the door later after she'd already given her spill. Man, if I would have answered that door, I would have been like, okay, so we're not believing and we want to be a part of the community, but we don't want to be involved in this. I just would have went overboard 
over explaining everything. And my kids, my kids are so much better. Like, what is this? Oh, that's not for us, but thanks for inviting us. I was like, that is so much easier than what I would have done if I answered the door. So much easier. And it gets the same message across. We want to be involved, but on our but but we'll only be involved in what we're comfortable with type thing. Right. My kids did it in such a simple way without making it awkward at all. And it reminded me of my friend. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell one more story and then I'll let you tell yours. We had a friend move into the neighborhood and we were as we were becoming friends, I started to realize that she was gonna think I was Mormon because she asked me where John and I met and I said at school. And then she's like, which school? I'm like, a university in Idaho. And she's like, the university in Idaho? I'm like, no. She's like, which one? I'm like, BYU, Idaho. And then she like asks where we got married. I'm like, we got married in Logan. And she's like, oh, the Logan Temple. And I'm like, well, I can't say no to that because that is definitely where we got married. <laughs> you know? And so at one point I was like, it was killing me because I thought she was just the best. And we are such good friends, but I was like, I'm going to lose this friendship when she finds out my, my secret. Right. <laughs> and I just couldn't, I just couldn't bear it anymore. So one day I went over and I was like, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm not Mormon. <laughs> well, she told me later, cause we still talk about this moment now, how in that moment she was like, do I go into this long spill about how I don't care and I can we can still be friends? And she was like debating whether to do that. Or she's like, or maybe I'll just show her by the way I act. <laughs> and it's true, like she I feel so comfortable with with her. And I feel like she truly accepts me. And I feel like that's been really healing for me to yes. have a Mormon give me so much acceptance because it, it allowed me to let go of this idea that I was the enemy. <laughs> I love that. I think it's a protecting thing again, yeah. that I'm trying to protect myself from hurt. I'm not even giving people the opportunity to act in a different way. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think it takes time too. She already had that background experience with you to know that you were a good, genuine person. That's not always what members have when you leave, though. Like, mm -hmm. they need... You've made a huge change in your life, and I feel like it does take time for them to realize, oh, you are still the same mm -hmm. genuine person yeah. that had uh -huh. the same values. In fact, mm -hmm. it's those values that made me feel like I needed to separate myself from the church. I it's think really cool. also... From her background, she had she had left a um, highly Mormon concentrated area and had practiced having relationships outside of Mormonism, like friendships outside, which made her more open to the idea. I've just lived my whole life in Mormonly dominant communities, so that's kind of a bizarre idea to me. I deserve the Mother of the Year award for this story. Um, we got a temple preview invite and so it's interesting our names are not on the church records but mm -hmm. our names are written in by hand we're one of those families in the ward mm -hmm. yes we get a temple preview thing and i look at it and i go yep we're not doing that and i didn't even mm -hmm. look at it again and had i looked at it i would have noticed it was on a weekday not on a sunday it would have been on the normal like primary activity time so I get distracted because my younger daughter, um, her teacher couldn't go and needed, they needed two deep leaders. And so they asked a mom to come. So I went and subbed, this is that one that I was telling you about. So I'm having this experience like going, oh, this isn't too triggering. I'm doing fine in this church building, helping out with this activity. So the three of us are walking out of the building and Rachel's like, that was weird. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, everybody was in a dress. And I'm like, oh, oh no. So anyways, she said she felt really down at, at first. And then 
one of the awesome families in our ward sat by her and started talking about volleyball. She likes volleyball. And she's like, it was better after that. And there weren't a lot of families there. There's like only three girls. Mm -hmm. She was a really good sport about it a lot. Anyway. Yeah. I feel like a terrible mother though. Cause how stupid other awkward situations. It's so funny when it happens in reverse because I feel like I'm always navigating the awkwardness. Yeah. Like, but sometimes it happens in reverse. Like one of my friends came running down to the house and they're like, Stephanie, your kid was over at the house and conference came on and they want to watch it with us. And I don't know how you feel about that. You know, I'm like, Oh, just the fact that you're like so concerned about how I feel just like, I don't know, it says to me that how much I can trust you with my kids. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I guess maybe I had a lot of anxiety in the beginning of the kids, like believing it and how threatening that would be to me. If the, the farther I get away from it, I'm like, I don't know, like, what if it's what they need? I needed it for a period of my life. Well, I don't know if I needed it, but no, I feel like I needed what it gave me, like community, safety. And if they can't find community anywhere else, and this is the only place where they feel loved and accepted, who am I to take that away from them? And I'm over here like, respect my beliefs, respect my beliefs, you know? Yeah. So it's hypocritical for me to be like, my kids can only believe the same way as me. I don't feel like I have complete wisdom, right? And so when you have a community of people that are yeah. you trust and you are around, that's going to give your children the opportunity to learn things from a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And um, that's valuable. And obviously you still have that even if you're not going to church every week because they are rubbing shoulders with their teachers at school and they mm -hmm. are um, hopefully having coaches and their sports activities and maybe a a musical instructor Maybe or something. Their best friends. Yes. Or, and their parents. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because if you harbor this this fear of, of these people in this community, then you can't be a part of it or allow your kids to be a part of it. And so like trying to find a way to navigate it is important. I want to share two things that have helped me for navigating the awkwardness of not of not being a believer, but being in a community where there's a lot of believing LDS members. And the I think like whenever you are in those awkward situations, I think that one of the things that helps me the most is to think about the perspective of the other person. So if someone's coming at me because I swore, this happened to me once. I got caught swearing and they were coming at me and I was like, you know what, to them, this word felt really heavy, dirty, evil, even though it was that those weren't my intentions. So seeing like they're reacting this way because of how they feel, not and not taking it so personal maybe validating their side of the story. And I find when you validate people, they'll calm down a lot. And then they're more willing to hear your side of the story, which right. is, I'm, I'm sorry that hurt you, but you know, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with using this word and using it in jest. Yes. I'm still really intentional to not use it in a hurtful way, just like I would with any other word. Um, but recently I've just got more comfortable using it in this way. And, and if it offends you, I won't, I won't use it around you anymore. You know, so I'm still owning myself, which is, I'm not afraid of swear words anymore, but also honoring that if I'm going to be a part of this community, uh, this group of people, then I can't, you know, it means something different to them. Yeah. It's hard to validate other people when you're hurt, when it hurts you. It, when it feels like rejection. So I think it's also important, like when you walk away from experience with a lot of pain to be like, why does this hurt so much? And like, well, it hurts because it feels like a rejection of, of me. And 
I don't like feeling rejected. Maybe another time you walk away from an experience and you're like, why does this feel this way? Well, it's because um, I believe differently and I'm used to everyone agreeing with my beliefs. I'm used to having everyone believe the same as me and I'm not used to believing differently than people. You know, and that's why I feel so awkward, like validating myself. Why, why am I experiencing it this way? Not being afraid to look at it for what it is. And, and, and I don't know, I guess maybe going through the morning process a bit, but it's just important to not say like, I shouldn't feel these things. I shouldn't feel awkward. I shouldn't. Well, there's a reason I'm feeling awkward. I'm used to people agreeing with me. I'm used to getting a lot of validation from the church. Um, I'm still learning how to validate myself, which is a foreign concept to me. This person still assumes the worst of me, but over time, I think their opinion will change. I think validating their experience and your experience can help you if you have a desire to be a part of a community that thinks differently than you do. There's sometimes I feel like there's a paradox here. And maybe we can explore this a little bit. So sometimes it's hard to know, am I doing this because I'm afraid? Wearing like a sleeveless sundress to some kind of activity might make other people feel uncomfortable. At what point are you respecting their beliefs? And at what point are you just, should you just be you because you like this, this outfit or something? Like, at where where is that boundary or is it just situational like how do you navigate that like here's another example drinking coffee is something that is not evil by pretty much any metric in the world except for um a certain religion that i happen to live in the middle of so do you not drink coffee to respect other people's religious beliefs, is that an okay thing? Or at what point do you say, this is a normal okay thing to do that's not evil? Like, how do you navigate that and know when you're being pushed around versus you're just being respectful? So I love what Jennifer Finlayson Fife says. She's a, she's a Mormon sex therapist. There's this one thing she says that really resonates with me. Belonging to yourself and belonging to a community, whether that's like a marriage, a family, uh, or a, a community of people. Sometimes we might wear the sundress because we don't want to be misunderstood. We're wearing it to send a message. Like, I'm here at church, but I want you to know I'm here on my own terms, right? Um, sometimes it's more out of spite, like, I'm going to make you all uncomfortable because <laughs> that's all you do to me all the time is make me uncomfortable. And sometimes it's like really thoughtless, like, oh, I put this dress on this morning. I didn't even think about who I'd be running into today. And now I'm in this awkward situation, <laughs> but I, I'm not, I'm not going to put words in Jennifer from Lace and Fife's mouth, but the way I took what she said is it's just a balance of belonging to yourself and belonging to others and making choices that you can be proud of, that you can own at the end of the day. My whole swearing thing, like someone might navigate that completely different and that's fine. And it, I think that's what, what I want overall is for people to, to trust their instincts. And that's my big biff with the church is that we're not allowed to do that. And, and be mindful of like, it's important for you to belong to yourself. And it's also important for you to have relationships. Both things are important for your health. Yeah, and and it, figured out. I, think, I think there's probably no hard, fast rule for trying to find that balance. And I think you might make a choice thinking, okay, mm -hmm. this is my best guess of what I should do in this situation. Mm -hmm. And you go through and you go through the experience, you gain more data, and you go, oh, you know what? That wasn't sending the message or doing what I thought it would do. This wasn't yeah. empowering to me at all or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I see how much that hurt somebody. And so you go, maybe it is worth me forgoing my whatever it is so mm -hmm. I can be respectful. And like, like you said, like swearing, yeah. like I can hold back a swear 
to make other people feel comfortable around me. Like that's yeah. not that big of a deal. I think it's just like a trial and error thing. And I don't think there is a hard, fast rule. And I think that's yeah. how you have to look at the situation and you have to figure out what you value more mm -hmm. the relationship sometimes. I and mean, also will learn and grow down the road and be more comfortable with you drinking coffee in front of them or whatever it is. It can yes. seem silly, but at the same time that you have to give other people space to be where they're at. If you want to have that relationship with them, I think. Yes. I, I have another story too. I think it's just nice to hear stories and, and how, how things worked out, but I wore a sleeveless dress to my brother's wedding. If I would have done that at the beginning of my faith transition, I would have been very defensive. I would have been looking for people looking at me and I would have been assigning intentions about what their looks mean. Where I am now, wearing a sleeveless dress to my brother's wedding was no big deal for me. I was able to wear it in confidence. I didn't really think much about it at all most of the day. Like it, I wonder if sometimes the intentions we take into it can also affect the results. And then there was one time, one time during the whole day that I thought about my sleeveless dress. And that was, I was talking to my grandma and she was looking at my shoulder the whole time. And I actually, in the beginning, couldn't figure out why she wasn't looking me in the face. I, I, cause I wasn't even aware of the, the sleeveless dress. It was just what I wore. And then it occurred to me, I was like, oh, I never told grandma about my like really personal transition. Maybe this is her first time experiencing me as different than she is used to experiencing me. In the very beginning, if my grandma was staring at my shoulder, how, how that would have made me feel. Would have made me feel insecure. Would have made me feel little. Would have made me want to cry or cover up, but ashamed. Now I'm like, this is my grandma's experience and she's handling it like a champ. She hasn't said anything and she's still here talking to me and I love my grandma. She's the best. It was a completely different experience based off of where I am now and where I was. And, and it's not to shame where I was because where I was is where I had to be to get to here. Unfortunately, I think a lot of members only notice when people are in that painful spot. And so then they get this impression that anybody that leaves the church ends up like just this mess <laughs> and it's like that's not how that's not how you hope people stay i think maybe it does take longer for some people to come out of that some people don't have the support system i've had they they definitely don't have the experiences i've had because everyone has their own experiences i think i've had some experiences that have helped me you know um, and I think it would have been a lot harder if I had to go through it on my own with, without some key players and experiences. I'm basically zero judgmental of however long it takes anybody to go through that because um, I have no idea what they're going through. I, I started to take responsibility for stuff more just in a kind of a life is suffering kind of a way you nobody is dealt a perfect hand in life and so i wanted to blame the church and i just kind of moved past that and said this was the hand i was dealt i'm going to make the most of it and there were things that i ignored when my oldest was a baby like we lived in this tiny little apartment and i can still remember looking on a wikipedia page about mormonism going wait this isn't what i know and seeing the rabbit hole and choosing not to go down the rabbit hole. And that was my choice. And at some point I feel like I have to take responsibility for, for some of that. It doesn't mean that the church is okay doing what it's doing. I'm not trying to say that, but as far as my own personal experience, I noticed as I started to just take on all the responsibility that I could it empowered me to move on. I feel a lot better now it's also helped me realize that a lot of people that are in the church that are struggling with their faith that have the desire to stay, they might need support to do what they need to do. And that might be stay. And I should be able to support them in that.
that shouldn't hurt me to support someone in what they want to do with their own life. I do believe that when people learn basically the critical arguments toward the church, and if everybody, if all members knew all of those arguments, their belief, it would, and I don't think necessarily everybody would leave, but their beliefs would change. And I think that's a much healthier belief that you come out of the back of knowing the critical arguments. The, the people that I've rubbed shoulders with, um, the members that I've rubbed shoulders with, that, that I feel like have a lot of wisdom and I feel like are very admirable, they know the critical arguments. And um, so I think they're, I, I think it'd be wise for people to learn the information, but it's not my job to show them. They are adults. They know how to use Google. <laughs> they can go learn it when they're ready. And I think, I don't know, I think when you're willingly ready to face tough stuff is when you're more likely to be able to handle it too. So I don't know. I agree. I think meeting everyone where they're at, not just religiously speaking, but in life in general is probably good advice. Making someone feel bad about themselves does not yield good results in life. Um, so I think for Mormons and ex-Mormons, we want to see a change, right? Like ex-Mormons want to see Mormons exposed to their, we want to see the, the critical arguments exposed. The Mormons want to see us come back. Well, and then I think like when you have relationships with people and you realize you have more in common than these fundamental beliefs, mm -hmm. it gives you a place where you can trust people more and then it, you feel safer learning certain things too. Because you're like, oh, there's a lot of really good people out there that aren't members of the church that have learned the wisdom without the church. Maybe I don't need the church to have that wisdom, I guess. The year I left the church, I had an exchange student and she was raised atheist. And so having her in my house and just seeing like how we were raised completely different, but we, we've come to a lot of the same views on certain things. And, and it was also interesting to see how she saw the world differently. And that whole experience was just really interesting for me. It made me start to give up the idea that the church was the only good way to live your life, the only good way to raise kids. Because I think even when I first left, even though I was pretty sure that the church wasn't what it claimed to be, and it, I wasn't going to be able to believe in it anymore. I still have this idea that, like, okay, maybe if it's not, maybe it's not true, but also, like, about your kids, yeah, and like all the successful people that I know were Mormon. Just like my limited experience told me that Mormons have have got something going on for them. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying. Also, other people have stuff going on for them, too. It's not exclusive to Mormonism. And, and that was mind-expanding for me. It's really good for me. Yeah, I, had an, I had an interaction with an atheist that I met on YouTube, and she went through kind of a similar, similar experience to me. So her grandpa was actually a, a Mason, and her dad was so turned off by Freemasonry and religion altogether that they were like devout atheists. She grows up and she's an adult. She decides to have four kids. She starts running around with a bunch of Christian moms. And she actually has this epiphany that she believes in God. And so she had this like flip experience of what I had. And it's very interesting because... I feel like it's hard not being on the beaten path, whatever that beaten path is set out for you. I just think it's really brave of people, whether they're right or wrong, I think it's really brave to go off the beaten path and um, brave the wilderness, right? And not really, I think the really scary thing about that is, is you could be wrong. Like, I think when you are first leaving the church, you realize like this might not be right. And even now where I'm at now, I mean, I don't have, 
an eight ball. I don't know what my life's going to look like, look like if I'd stayed versus now where I'm going, who knows, maybe like 30 years from now, I'm going to be like, that was a mistake. <laughs> I, I don't know that unless you choose a path that ends in your death. <laughs> like, yeah. I, don't, I, I think life is pretty forgiving, I guess. I feel like you can make some mistakes. So maybe I'm going to be in outer, outer darkness for having the light and choosing not to. Oh. So maybe we should talk about that. That's something I really struggled with. Um, in the beginning, I was like, what if it's true? Okay, so I decided if there is a God, then, then he's either really compassionate and will knows me completely and will know the struggle I had, know that I did my best, and judge me off that. Or there's a God who has a list of commandments, and if he gave them to you and you didn't follow, he's going to put you in outer darkness. And he believes in segregating people by righteousness. Okay, if that God exists, I'm not going to follow his rules. No, no way, Jose, that's not fair. I just That's just not what I'm about. That's not what I stand for. So no, I'm going to fight you. So I'm good. Either compassionate, understand, saved, how I was raised, I'm against, <laughs> big fight, or he doesn't exist and I should live my life the way I want to in a way that I can be proud of, the way that fulfills me. And that's how I came to the decision that I'm making the choices that I can live with because those are the three outcomes. And I am, so, and my choices, I look how they line up with all three of those outcomes. That's what I can live with. I think the, the hardest part for me is, even though Mormons are one per, less than 1% of the world population, but that's not my life experience because I live in highly concentrated areas. So my experience is we are more than half of my world, the world I've experienced. Life in general, you look at like a general consensus is more likely to be correct than just one person. So I've got this warped idea that if, if more than half the people around me believe this, maybe I'm wrong. And I think that's what I struggled with leaving. That's actually a really good point. And I think that's really interesting. If we're trying to figure out if something is real, we can see it. Okay, so there's one way that we can kind of see if that something's real. Okay, if we can see it and we can touch it, okay, that even helps more. And then if we can hear it, wrestling, we taste it, smell it. So we have all these senses that kind of help us know that something is real. Now, if we've got someone next to us that also can see and, and touch and hear, and that also boosts our confidence, right? And that's mm -hmm. just how, that's just how we work, right? And so when yeah. we are in like a, a community bubble, you sometimes become blind to the same things. You don't notice that you might not be believing something. <laughs> correctly because everybody around you is also believing that thing. Anything that I second guessed had to do with um, religious communities in general. That's And that's still actually where some of my hesitation is. I feel like religious communities get you access to your neighbors better than really any other way, unless you're the really outgoing neighbor that just happens to be really friendly. Um, I We lived in Colorado and we did not know anybody on our street. Our next door neighbor we knew. She had kids the same age as our kids. Um, but other than that, we did not know anybody on our street. And we were kind of friendly with a couple of them. They were they would at least wave at us. But um, the only ones on our street that we knew. So there's probably like it was a really cookie cutter neighborhood. And there's probably over a hundred houses on our street, and we knew the two that were LDS. <laughs> so, yeah. so. There is something there about religious communities that can bring together people um, in a way that seems to be missing from secular type living arrangements anyway. I don't know. So that's something I worry about just as a society in general. Like if we don't uphold these, um, I don't know. It's not even the religion, it's just these communities in general. And we're only together with people that agree politically with us. Because at church, you'd get, I mean, it was definitely around here, it leans conservative. But you still get those those liberals at church. And you're like, well, 
they believe in Christ too. And so you, you respect them. You have this common belief that holds you together and don't know if, if politics become our new religion, then that's not good. <laughs> so you're saying that church um, brings people with different opinions together with, but they're, they have a common belief so they can tolerate listening to each other and, and growing. I've never thought of it that way, but I, I think that's an interesting idea. I have thought about community because that was the hardest part to lose after leaving the church. And I, what I came up with is things that build community school, like whether that's elementary, high school, college, like going to school that builds a community workplace has opportunity to build community. The people that you see every day at work, um, uh, volunteer opportunities, like workout groups, or um and then church right and and church was definitely the one that i leaned on the heaviest for community um and it was the hardest thing to give up i do agree that you do have to be more proactive in your community if you are going to distance yourself from the church whatever based off of whatever community you want so like i do have to go knock on my neighbor's doors. I do have to find ways to have us interacting more often to build those relationships. Another hard thing that, another thing that was hard for me is in the church, I interacted with the youth a lot. I was always in primary and young women's. And when I left the church, I was like, I'm not with the youth anymore. Like I never realized how fulfilling that was for me. You know, so I'm like, going to school to be a teacher. I don't know if I'm going to end up being a teacher or not, but it's an option. Like if I want to be interacting with the youth, I'm going to have a degree. I'm going to have opportunity to, to do that. And so I think the difference is, is you have to be more proactive. It's not going to just be handed to you. If you're, if you're not going to the church, you're not going to get an instant community. You're not going to get uh, a calling, but who's to say you can't create that or go find it somewhere else. Um, does it take creativity? Yes. Does it take effort? Yes. But is it possible? Yes. Yeah. And I think it sometimes can be more fulfilling. You know what your talents are and what you have to provide for the community. And so it's kind of an interesting, and it takes effort, right? You have to be paying attention. You have to be asking yourself the right questions to know like what you want to do with your time. I think it's, it's really cool to be able to ask yourself questions and who knows where the answers come from, but you always seem to have something that's driving you that you can listen to and you can follow. And then as you start working toward that path, you get more feedback to figure out if you're going, if you're going the right direction and whatever right is, as I've been practicing that and not going and Googling LDS.org on like what I should think and believe, <laughs> like, and actually just trying to research things myself and, and guide myself who knows where that's coming from? I mean, that could be the spirit, right? There's members of the church that do act like that in their life. Mm -hmm. And they aren't Googling LDS.org to figure out what they believe. They're actually just reading the scriptures in general. And it's coming from within them. Some people will call it intuition. Some people will call it the Holy Ghost. I think, I think it's just important for your health in general to feel in your heart that you're making the right decisions and, and to be able to follow that and and to be able to pivot if you feel like you're wrong. I'm really glad that we were able to like sit down and talk about this because I, I think it's helpful to listen to a variety of different experiences. And Marty, I know you bring a, an experience to the table that really speaks to me and talking to you really helps me give permission to get back involved in my community despite being with so many Mormons. I really had that desire, but I didn't know how to navigate it. And I didn't need permission. Um, but I guess I kind of needed permission. Like I was looking for permission, even though you don't need permission to do this. I feel like talking to you, like gave me that permission to go into those awkward spaces and figure it out. So I'm really glad that we found each other through YouTube and met each other. Um, because I'm really happy with, how how going back in those awkward situations has helped me grow 
and the community I've been able to build around me and how it includes people that I value who have different belief systems than me. And I, I like who you are. And if your belief, if this is part of who you are, then I'm willing to hold that. I think that's with every relationship. You're never going to find someone who thinks exactly the same as you in every way. And if you did, it would be awfully boring. <laughs> and it, we do this with people with everything, like political views, um, style. <laughs> like <laughs> some people have different style than we do. Uh, some people are introverts, some are extroverts. Like it, we do this all the time in life. And I think it, when you leave, it, be, it becomes really threatening to hold that space for someone else. But if you can learn how to do it, then then you you just have a skill that can benefit you. I'm just more comfortable living my day to day life when this is more in the backseat and not driving my life. So, right. Like, well, when I'm focusing on my actual life, my goals they really don't have anything to do with my previous belief. Except for mm -hmm. now, they kind of do because I would love to help people foster relationships with people they don't agree with. Cause I think yeah. we are so much more alike than we are different. So. Yeah. Yep. And which is why I wanted to talk today. I think this is, I, I loved the conversation you sent me and I'm like, I'd love to be a part of a, a tangent of that conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. And I think there were some awesome stories in there. Well, Thanks for having me on for this conversation. I really enjoyed your first conversation and I was excited to talk uh, more about this direction, the, the healing, the coming together with, with your community, even if you find yourself on another side of the belief system. So it was fun to talk about it and think about it and maybe someone hears this and has some epiphanies. That'd be cool.